Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, <clears throat> this is going to be very fast. So, <laughs> the, the important thing is not to understand how it works, but what it does, because uh, uh, the, this is just a prototype that we built over the last couple of years. So I'm going to talk about um, the activities around FAIR data at uh, Biohack 2015 and, and 2016. Uh, so, at uh, Biohack 2015, uh, largely driven by Michel de Montier, uh, we finally came up with the final wording of the FAIR principles. The idea is that data should be findable with unambiguous identifiers supported by searchable metadata, should be accessible with a clearly defined access protocol that is preferably machine actionable, it should be interoperable using shared vocabularies in a machine accessible format, and reusable, meaning that it should have sufficient contextual information that you can interpret the data correctly and rich provenance information to facilitate citation. So that was the primary technical activity at Biohack 2015. Um, and I mentioned that this should apply to both metadata and data because I'm going to split the talk up into these two sections. So at 20, Biohack 2016 is when I really started to build some technology that does fare. Um, the general idea that we had, we had arrived at was that we should put metadata into an iterative set of nearly identical containers. So from repository level to database level to data set level to record level to, to whatever goes below that. At the bottom would be the metadata for an individual data record and a pointer to that data record, possibly as fine-grained as a single cell in a spreadsheet. So all the way from repository, all the way down to possibly an individual cell. So this is what it looks like uh, in the prototype. We published this about eight months ago. So it's called the FAIR Accessor, and FAIR Accessors provide machine actual structured REST-oriented way to publish metadata about a very wide range of things. So what kinds of things can we describe? We can describe warehouses like EBI, databases like Uniprot, Repositories uh, like Zenodo datasets, for example, the output from a workflow. Research objects, so combinations of uh, workflows, the data comes out of the workflow and the publications that result from that. Uh, data slices, for example, a database query. And individual data records, so images, Excel files, individual rows in those Excel files, clinical records, and so on. Uh, the accessor is based on the linked data platform in our prototype we don't actually do a full uh, LDP implementation, we just use it as, as a uh, inspiration. <clears throat> but in particular, we were interested in the concept of the LDP container. Um, so fair accessors are based on the LDP container, and what they look like is this. You have uh, two resources, resource meaning URLs. Uh, the first one is a container, and the second one is a meta record. Inside of the container, you have a contains predicate and then a list of meta record resources, and those represent this, which you call, and you get the record. So at the top level, the, the biggest Russian doll, you have a container, which is the URL. You call get, and at the moment we only use get, although LDP supports both read and write. And then you get a rich metadata document that describes what that container is. So it's a warehouse, it's a repository, data slice, and so on and then a list of the URIs that are contained by that particular container or that resource. Looking closely at one of those, you have, the, this is the resource that is contained, you call get, and you get again a metadata record that describes that resource. Uh, you're told exactly what resource it is using both primary topic. So I can say, for example, I'm talking about this Uniprot record with this metadata document. And then using uh, DCAT, uh, the FAIR accessor might, depending on the nature of the underlying data, it might tell you how to get the data itself. So in this case, we have a distribution that says, at this URL, you can get the data in XML format, and at this URL, you can get the data in RDF format. So these are the distributions that are possible for that particular record. So in this case, I've shown you only a single level of a hierarchy, but in fact, you can arbitrarily extend this to as many layers as you, as you need. So the primary features of the FAIR Accessor is that there's no API. 
right? You, you call get on a URL, you interpret the metadata, you select the desired resource, and you call get, and get, and get, and get. So there's no API. One of the nice things that uh, appeals to me most is that you now have a way of identifying previously unidentifiable things. So for example, the output from a database query can now be represented by a URL and the metadata around that to describe why you did the query in the first place and what the content of that query output was. Uh, you have a predictable place to put metadata. So, so different kinds of metadata, at the repository level all the way down to the record level, have distinct ontological types, but also uh, there's no ambiguity where, regarding where that metadata could, should be. And so here's the dataset metadata, and here's the record metadata, and it's in predictable locations. And there's symmetry. So I, 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 my machine can traverse down the hierarchy, but it can also traverse back up, because I'm using, for example, uh, the part of dataset predicate to point back upwards to the location of, for example, citation metadata. So I have a record metadata, like how do I cite it? My machine knows if I traverse back up, I can get to license, citation, and so on. So this is what it looks like. So this I built at the hackathon last year. So real world scenario, and this is actually live if you want to run it on your machines, I'll the, the URLs work. Um, so let's imagine you're publishing a paper describing protein evolution in RNA processing for aspergillus, and you want to be transparent and, and reproducible, so you have to describe in detail the inclusion and exclusion criteria for the proteins in your data set. Um, right now, there's no really good way to do that. So I'll show you what we did, because this is actually a real experiment. Um, so we have a container. This URL is live if you want to try it. Um, it returns RDF, so it might not render in your browser. So there's our container called get, and it's going to return a page of metadata. Uh, in this example, I'm rendering the metadata uh, using the tabulator plugin, so it's rendering as HTML, but in fact this is RDF. So this is the metadata that's returned. In this metadata, we have, for example, the title of the data set, uh, my ORCID, authored by me, uh, principal investigator me, and various other things uh, from the DCAT, for example, the type of basic containers and data sets. And here is the query. Thank you, Jurgen, for debugging my query. So this is the query that results in that data set. So this is, for example, the inclusion criteria for uh, what went into my experiment. If I go farther down the metadata document, we have keywords, so these are human readable, so the keywords for the monkeys, and then we have the DCAC theme, uh, which is a URL to a SCOS concept scheme. If we look at a concept scheme, we now have the machine readable metadata describing the content of that data set, so these are all ontology terms. So, keywords for monkeys, SCOS, on top, uh, SCOS concept scheme for machines, and then we have the contains predicate and the list of records that came out of that database query. So now we're looking at this part of the diagram. So I take one of those, I call get, and this is the document that's returned. Again, a metadata document rendered into HTML by the tabulator plugin. So diagrammatically, it's this. I, so my fourth primary topic is here. So my primary topic is this Uniprot record. So this metadata is about the Uniprot record. Right? Notice that it's switched. The top level metadata was about me. I was the author of that data set because it's my query. Now that we're down into the record, the, the metadata focus, the citation, the creator is Uniprot. I didn't create that record, they did. So I've now switched the metadata focus. My primary topic is this Uniprot record, and of course the citation and the creator are Uniprot. But to be symmetrical, in dataset, point back upwards to the metadata about me. Then we have the distributions. 
RDF and uh, HTML. So here's an RDF representation with this URL, and here's an HTML representation with this URL. And I want to point out that Unicron is pretty fair, but this is even more fair. Sorry, <laughs> this is even more fair because there is a clear machine readable path from this record to the citation information for that record. There's a distinct way to get to the citation, uh, which Unicron doesn't provide you if you simply download the uh, Unicron data and the license and so on. So it, it's taking Unicron's fair data and making it even more fair. Okay, so we focus so far on fair metadata, but really the, the holy grail is data. Right? We really want data to be fair. So this was my primary activity last year. It was called Fair Projection, which is providing fair data from non-fair data dynamically. Uh, we use two technologies for this. One is called Triple Pattern Fragments, and the other is RDF Mapping Language. Uh, TPF is from Ruben and already a mapping languages from Anastasia. I won't talk in detail about those because there's no time, but TPF is really a way to, to assign a URL to anything. In, in this case, we use it to identify slices of data. Uh, regardless of the underlying format of that data, we simply represent that data as a URL. And so if you call get on that URL, you're going to get RDF, regardless of what the original format was. RML is a way to describe triples. So I can say, look, I am going to give you RDF, and this is a model of the structure of that RDF. So in this case, the subject is going to be a patient record, the predicate is going to be has variant, and the object is going to be a SNP. So, Let's put all of this together. We say, look, the triple pattern fragment URL is just another distribution. Right? So I will give you the entire record in RDF, I will give you the entire record in XML, or if you call this, I will give you, again, RDF, but that RDF is going to be in this structure. So I can take an existing RDF record and project it out in a different ontological format if I want to. I can take an image, run it through an image processing algorithm, and project out RDF in some arbitrary format, uh, as long as I specify what it's going to look like. So here's the record. Here is the URL for the triple fragment server. And here is the model that describes the output from that triple fragment server. And we call that a fair projector. You have to write them, of course, so the TPF server has to be written, but they're actually not hard to write because TPF serves single triples, subject predicate object. Every one of those triples is exactly the same. So they're extremely easy to write. So projection is if I call get on this URL, I'm going to get RDF XML triples from this record following this format, and I can project out that data in whatever format I want, and it's discoverable. And because my projector can burrow all the way down to an individual spreadsheet cell, I now have discoverable REST-based access to both data and metadata in any repository, in any native format, all the way down to an individual spreadsheet cell. Discoverable access. And that's, in my opinion, the holy grail. Mic drop. <laughs> so I, I'm really, really pleased with this. I'm very excited. Because anyone who's known my activity in these biohackathons knows that this has been my dream for the last 10 years. And I'm really excited by the fact that it's now working at least in prototype form. So again, Toshiaki, if you were here, <laughs> thank you uh, for 10 years of successful biohackathons. Uh, funding, and you are welcome, please, to uh, reuse this presentation. Thanks.